Welcome again to the UC San Francisco Stanford Circe FDA Distinguished Speaker Series on Cybersecurity for Biomedical Engineering. Uh, I am your host, Kevin Fu, uh, Acting Director of Medical Device Cybersecurity at the Food and Drug Administration. And uh, again, welcome to this seminar series. Quick disclaimer, this seminar series does not reflect official FDA policy or guidance and the contents are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the official views nor an endorsement of the US government or FDA or HHS. This seminar is being recorded. We are here today because cybersecurity is increasingly becoming a big problem in the delivery of healthcare and in medical devices in particular. And so you need not uh, dig through a newspaper until you'll find articles on, on an almost daily basis about ransomware bringing down hospitals uh, or on the more preventative measures about steps that countries are taking to protect their infrastructure from cybersecurity threats. Uh, I will be your moderator today. Uh, and uh, it's, I am very pleased to be moderating uh, the talk today by Professor uh, Lori Craner. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker today before I hand it over to Lori. Uh, Lori is the director and the Bosch Distinguished Professor in Security and Privacy Technologies at Carnegie Mellon University's Scilab. She's also a professor of computer science and of engineering and public policy. Today, is she, she is going to talk about security and privacy for humans. And I think this is extremely important for the biomedical engineering community because of course, any kind of security solution that doesn't meet clinical workflow is going to be a very challenging solution indeed. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Lori's background. Uh, and I don't mean the background literally her quilt, uh, but Lori uh, has a long and decorated history at really uh, creating the field of usable security and privacy in my view. Uh, she also served as the chief technologist at the U.S. Uh, Federal Trade Commission, uh, where you can find all sorts of interesting blog entries from her role uh, uh, in that regulatory agency uh, uh, about primarily about privacy issues. And uh, she's also the uh, co-director of uh, uh, collaboration on against hate for research and action center at CMU. Uh, she's done so many different things and helped so many different leadership roles. And um, I'm just so happy that we have someone like Lori to lead the way uh, to bring students to this important area for how to innovate security and privacy to be usable for humans. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, hand over the mantle to uh, Professor Craner. Uh, and again, uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, share your thoughts on research and security and privacy for humans to this biomedical engineering community. Uh, thank you, Lori. All right, I think we're all set. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna talk about security and privacy for humans. And uh, often when we talk about humans in the context of security, it's in the context of blaming humans for being the weakest link, for making human errors that cause security breaches. Um, some have even said that, that most security breaches are actually caused by humans and errors in human behavior. So who are all of these uh, humans who are causing all these problems for us in computer security? Um, well, in computer security, we like to talk about threats and we talk about the human threat. And most often, if you look at a computer security textbook, you'll uh, read about the malicious humans. Uh, sometimes they're named like Mallory the malicious, Eve the evil attacker. Um, and so those are, of course, human threats. Um, but the human threats that I'm going to talk about today are not these malicious humans, um, but a different kind of human. Um, this includes the clueless humans who don't even realize that they're supposed to be doing some sort of a security task or taking measures to protect themselves or, or their system. Uh, this also includes the unmotivated humans. And so these are the humans who may know that there's something you're supposed to do, but why should I do it? It's not my job, somebody else should do it. Um, 
and and we often all fall into that category. Um, and then another category that we all fall into is humans constrained by human limitations. Uh, often security administrators will expect humans to do things that are like really difficult to do, like remember a large number of unique passwords without writing them down. Um, and, and that's difficult for most humans who don't have photographic memory for, for um, uh, remembering these sorts of things. Uh, so um, these are all the types of humans that end up posing a threat to our security systems, and we're going to talk about that. Now, besides security, I also want to touch on privacy, and privacy is also difficult for humans. Uh, we've seen that many popular um, uh, platforms and software have privacy settings that end up just confusing their users. Um, and it even, uh, you know, they, they hear that people are confused, they update them, and they end up just confusing people even more. Um, and the reason for this is that fundamentally, privacy is actually fairly complicated. It, it's not just that you have privacy or you don't have privacy, uh, but there are a lot of choices that you might have to make. And there may be trade-offs uh, where you balance wanting to have privacy, wanting to have control, but also wanting um, services and features that are convenient. Um, and so uh, privacy ends up being very complicated for users to manage. Now, in my research at Carnegie Mellon, where we've been focused on usable privacy and security, one of the things that we've seen is that if you try to just take a system that is very secure, but not very usable, and then hand it off to the usability experts and say, hey, make this usable, it usually doesn't work very well. Um, it's much better when you have usability experts and security and privacy experts working together from the beginning uh, to try to build a system that, that keeps all of these things in mind together. Now, one of the questions that I often get, uh, especially from people who um, focus on usability or human computer interaction is, all right, you're doing all of these sec security and privacy user studies isn't it the same thing that any other kind of HCI or usability person does? How are your studies any different? You know, why do you need a special course? I teach a course at Carnegie Mellon on usable privacy and security, um, but we also have a whole department teaching courses in HCI. So why do we need a special course in this? And um, there, there are a variety of reasons, but what I think is key to understanding um, a, a, an important difference here is that in usable privacy and security, we often have the presence of a risk or adversary. Um, so it's not just that we want our software to be understandable and to work, but that users need to be able to use it um, while there may be an attacker who is trying to uh, get them to, to mess up, uh, to, to um, let their guard down, um, or there may be um, some sort of a risk that if they don't get this right, their, their data or their information may actually be at risk. Um, and so when we do user studies in this area, we would like to uh, see whether people can use the system properly uh, in the presence of this adversary or risk. Um, but of course, we can't actually hurt participants in user studies. We can't actually put them at risk. And so we tend to design studies that have some sort of a simulated risk uh, so that um, we can see how people would respond. Um, and sometimes that simulated risk, uh, we're very explicit about. We say, you know, hypothetically, imagine the situation as we go through these tasks. Other times, um, we are not so... Um, uh, upfront about it, we may actually use deception in our studies and not tell people uh, about something that's going to occur during the study, uh, which may make them believe that they are at risk in real life, not just for the study. Uh, and then, of course, we debrief them at the end and let them know that, no, actually, we just made that up. You were not actually at risk. 
Um, another challenge that we have in our studies are that security and privacy are secondary tasks. So except for security experts, people tend not to buy a computer so they can do security. You know, they buy a computer so that they can do their job or they can use it at home so that they can you know, send email and video chat and play games. Um, and so uh, therefore doing user studies um, with people who, who are naturally using their computer for these purposes, and yet we want to see how they respond to security and privacy uh, can also be challenging. Now, one of the first research papers that focused on this idea of usable security was published in 1999 um, at Usenix Security, and it since has won a Test of Time Award um, called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. And this was uh, one of the first studies that pointed out that uh, security software, in this case, um, email encryption, was really hard for people to use. And uh, in a user study, they went through and identified some specific reasons why it was so difficult for people to use. Uh, so that was great. Um, but 22 years later, what we see is that Johnny still can't encrypt. Uh, we still have a lot of security software, which has some of the same problems that were pointed out over 22 years ago. And a big uh, cause of this problem is that we still rely on users to do security tasks that they aren't actually good at. Uh, and so uh, creating unique and memorable passwords is a big one that everyone can relate to. Um, and we've done some research in that area. So I'm gonna tell you about um, some of the studies that we've done uh, trying to understand this problem and also hopefully make it better. Right. So one of the things that we we have observed is that users have many misconceptions about passwords. So we've done studies where we bring users into our lab, um, we give them some um, some new accounts, and we ask them to create passwords for those accounts and think out loud and tell us about what what they're thinking as they're creating passwords. Um, from this, we've seen uh, some interesting things, um, which are really misconceptions. Uh, so we've seen many users who tell us about how they use keyboard patterns when creating passwords. And they say, you know, I can remember this really easily. I just go diagonally across the keyboard. Um, and look, I have these random combinations. Well, of course, we know that's not actually random. That is a pattern on the keyboard. Um, and it is so common to use this particular pattern, but as well as many other patterns that you can find on the keyboard, that most of the dictionaries that hackers use to guess passwords uh, have the whole set of, of patterns from keyboards. Uh, are the, and they, they come up very quickly um, when hackers um, try to guess passwords. Um, and so this is a misconception and, and this is not at all secure. Another common misconception is that adding a symbol and especially an exclamation point to the end of a password will make it secure. Uh, so in our study, we had users who said, um, I'm going to create a password. Uh, I like monkeys. I'm going to create the password monkey. Yeah, yeah, I know that's not very secure, but I'll put an exclamation point on the end. Now it's a secure password. Um, and that is also completely a misconception. And where does that come from? Well, what happens is that when users try to create passwords, they often get feedback uh, from the, the, uh, the website that they're creating a password on. And, it, and uh, there may be a password meter or there may be a prompt. And, um, and often it will say things like, to make your password stronger, add a symbol. And so they take the password that they were typing, they put a symbol on the end, and now it's an acceptable password. And so from that, they have learned, oh, I, all I have to do is put a symbol on the end and it will be good. Um, and it turns out that because humans tend to all think alike, uh, we've all decided that exclamation point is the best symbol to add to the end. And that is by far the most popular um, thing that people do to comply with password policies. Uh, sometimes people will also do things like uh, add a capital letter and, this, won't, this shouldn't come as any surprise. When you add a capital letter, you probably add it at the beginning of the password. So that also doesn't really add any strength to your password. Uh, we did a study where we uh, showed people online pairs of passwords and we gave them this scale and they had to tell us um, which password was stronger or were they equally strong on the scale. 
And so we, we showed them a whole bunch of different pairs. Um, and we knew how strong the passwords were based on uh, a system we developed, which, which can estimate the strength of passwords. So here we have these two passwords. Um, and uh, if we were all in, in the same room, I, I would ask with a show of hands. Uh, but here you can just do it in your head to think about which one you think is stronger. Um, what uh, people in our study said is, well, these two passwords are the same number of letters and the same digits. Uh, they must be equally strong. But this is a misconception. It turns out that I eat kale 88 is way, way more secure than I love you 88. And the reason for this is I love you turns out to be a very common string that appears in passwords um, and in every language. Uh, people, people like to talk about love in their passwords for some reason. Um, it seems to be human nature. Um, people do not like to eat kale or talk about kale. Um, certainly my kids don't like to eat or talk about kale. Um, and uh, and it, it rarely, kale rarely shows up in, in passwords. And so this is much more secure. Um, but what we see is that this, this notion that there are certain phrases that everybody uses and puts in their passwords is actually not widely understood by the general public. And so uh, it doesn't occur to people that they shouldn't put uh, these phrases that come very naturally to them in their passwords because everybody's doing it. As I mentioned, most password meters are not helping. And in fact, they may be reinforcing bad habits. Uh, they give you feedback like your password is weak, create a stronger password, which doesn't really help. And so in my lab, we used what we learned from many years of password studies to develop our own password meter. And this password meter, uh, first of all, gives more accurate feedback than most, but it also gives um, what we think are more helpful suggestions. And we've done studies to actually validate this. Um, and so for example, if you put a digit at the end of your password, it will suggest consider inserting digits into the middle, not just at the end. Uh, and that would give you a stronger password. We have a demo online that you can play with, but please don't enter your real passwords uh, into our demo. All right, um, our most recent paper on passwords, um, which came out uh, uh, about a year ago, was um, what we'd actually been trying to do for 10 years on this research stream. Uh, what we really wanted to, to do was answer the question for system administrators, uh, when you create a system and ask people to create passwords, what rules should you enforce about passwords, which will balance having really strong passwords, but also passwords that people can actually deal with, that they'll be able to remember. Um, and um, uh, so we, we spent 10 years running studies and trying to figure this out. Um, we finally have an answer. And uh, basically what our, our answer uh, says is that, um, uh, first of all, longer passwords tend to be better, that you get more benefit from having users make longer passwords than having all sorts of crazy password rules. Uh, but we also find that um, one thing that you can do is if you have a really good password meter uh, like ours, which is using machine learning in order to evaluate passwords and give you a score, you can simply set a score and say for a password to be acceptable, it has to meet a certain minimum score. Uh, and then you can give that feedback to the user and that actually works pretty well. Okay, so another thing that we've seen is that because people have so many passwords, what they end up doing to cope is they reuse them uh, and they reuse them a lot. And we, um, we knew that, um, but we didn't quite know the extent that people were reusing their passwords. Uh, so we have a study where we um, have recruited home computer users, home Windows computer users, uh, and they sign up for our study. We pay them every month that they um, participate in our study and have their computers automatically send us data. Um, and uh, at any given time, while we were collecting this data, we had about 200 active participants in the study. And we were getting um, uh, natural observations. So we were getting data that their computers uh, would just collect and send us. Uh, and periodically we would uh, send them surveys, which we'd pay them extra for, or we would ask them to participate in interviews. 
uh, one of the things that we were collecting off their computer were hashes of the passwords that they entered into their web browser. And so this allowed us to uh, look at password reuse. Right. So what we found is that on average, the participants in our study had 26 different accounts that they were accessing with a password in the web browser that we had instrumented in the study. Um, and of those 26 different accounts, uh, there were 10 distinct passwords on average that a person would have. Uh, so there's a lot of reuse going on there. Uh, but we found that these passwords actually um, were not completely distinct. Uh, in fact, what we found is that um, often people would have a password and they would change just one letter in the password um, in order to make a new password. Um, and so we call that a partially reused password. In fact, what we found is that half of the passwords that people used were either exactly or partially reused. Um, another 16% were exactly reused, 12% were partially reused. So only 21% of passwords were unique, that, that, that that person only used them at one website. So then we wondered, well, maybe people are reusing passwords at websites they don't really care about. And at the important passwords, maybe those are the 21% that are not being reused. So um, we looked at the type of website uh, for each of the passwords. And uh, through every category of website, you can see the green part of the bar, those are the not reused passwords, is pretty small. So, and that includes shopping, educational, financial, work, websites, all of these have a very small fraction of website, uh, have passwords that are not being reused. Um, so th this shows that, that in fact, this is actually a problem even at important sites. Right? Why is this such a problem? Um, the reason it's such a problem is because attackers know that people reuse their passwords and they exploit it. So if we have an attacker who has um, gotten a list of cracked passwords or has cracked them themselves, they may go through the list and the attacker may see here, oh, Jim, his password is monkey one. All right, let me go to other websites and try the username Jim and monkey one and see if I can get into some more of Jim's accounts. Um, and then we may see that there, that there are some places that Jim doesn't use monkey one. So let's try monkey two and monkey three also, um, and maybe we'll get into even more accounts. And there, there's a lot of evidence of attackers actually doing this. This is not hypothetical. So this is a big problem. Um, one way that uh, some organizations try to combat this problem is by asking users to change their passwords frequently. Um, and um, this is not necessarily a great strategy. Uh, so, you know, we see campaigns like this, passwords are like underpants, change them often. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this um, because the, the uh, research shows that this doesn't really help. Um, the theory behind frequent password changes is that a user may have their account compromised and not know it. So there's an attacker who is happily using the user's password and is, um, is you know, logging into their system whenever they want. And then if that user changes their password, now the attacker is locked out. Uh, that's the theory. And so uh, my friends at the U University of North Carolina, um, about a decade ago, they actually tested this theory. So at UNC, they had a policy at the time that everybody had to change their password every three months. Um, and they would keep the old defunct passwords. And so the researchers were able to gain access to that database of defunct passwords. Um, and they were able to uh, look at people's old passwords and, um, and run machine learning algorithms over them to figure out how they change them in their subsequent passwords. Um, and so what they discovered is that people make a lot of very predictable transformations. Uh, so people will take a password with a lowercase letter and the next time they'll capitalize it. Um, they'll take a password uh, with a digit and they'll increment it. Um, or they'll turn the digit into a symbol that's on the same key. Um, and then something that wasn't in that paper, but we've observed in our research is sometimes people will simply append uh, the date or part of the date that they changed the password. 
So if you know you have to change the password quarterly, you know, you just put the month and year that you created the password and you just change that each time. That's really easy to remember. And now you have a unique password, but also one that is really easy for an attacker to figure out your pattern. Uh, so they, uh, after having done this, they took um, all of these defunct passwords and they applied these new um, transformations to try to see if they could guess people's next password in the sequence. Um, they found that if they did an online attack where someone would only get you know, five guesses, that they could crack 17% of accounts in five guesses. If they had an offline attack, which an attacker would go and make you know, millions, billions of guesses um, constrained only by the speed of their computer, they said with three seconds of guessing, they could crack 41% of accounts. And they could probably crack a lot more with more guessing or, or faster computers. Um, so this shows that you don't really get a whole lot of protection by forcing people to change passwords. Um, and it certainly makes people mad. And it may um, result sometimes in people not choosing as good a password to begin with. So when I was at the FTC, um, I uh, uh, started talking to our system administrators about this because the FTC, like most government agencies, requires frequent password changes. Um, and uh, I ended up writing this blog post, which was on the front page of the FTC website and got a lot of publicity. Around the same time in the UK, their security agency started saying the same thing. Um, and ultimately, in 2017, NIST, which had been recommending regular password expiry, came out with new password guidelines where they actually recommended against it. Um, so that's good news. Uh, nonetheless, we still have lots of systems that still require regular password expiry, uh, but at least now we have um, guidelines that say, nope, that, that's not really all that helpful. And so hopefully over time, that will change. Right, so if we can't protect ourselves by constantly changing our passwords, what can we do? And um, what a lot of security experts say is that we should use two-factor or multi-factor authentication and password managers. Um, but the voluntary adoption of both of these things is pretty low. Of course, some organizations now require it, and that, that is great, and it solves a lot of problems. But for accounts where it's not required, it's still been pretty slow to get people to adopt these things. So we looked into this at Carnegie Mellon. Um, Carnegie Mellon now actually requires uh, two-factor authentication of everyone. But when they first rolled it out, uh, they only required it of people who were on the university payroll. So students who didn't have a campus job were not required to use two-factor authentication. Um, the, the particular type of two-factor that was adopted at CMU is a system called Duo. Um, and uh, basically, um, you, you can use this on your smartphone. And every time you try to log into the CMU um, single sign-on system, uh, you have it send you a push, which shows up on your phone. And there are a few other modes you could use it in. Um, one of the uh, nice features of the way CMU set this up is there was a remember me for 30 days button. So if you use the same device to log in with 30 days, you didn't have to go through Duo again. Um, okay, so we collected data on the rollout of two-factor authentication at CMU. We surveyed people before the mandatory adoption deadline. Um, then we surveyed people um, three months after the deadline, and we got access to help desk and access log data. So just a few highlights of some of the things we found. Um, one thing we found is that the faculty and staff, um, once it had rolled out, they said, yeah, this really isn't so bad, uh, whereas students really didn't like it. And the difference here was the Remember Me feature. So when I would log in um, in my office, it's my old office, um, I would always use the same computer. And, um, and so I would only really have to, to um, uh, authenticate with Duo once every 30 days. But the students, every time they went to a different computer lab or sat down at a different desk at a computer lab, they would have to uh, authenticate with Duo again. And so this made it much more annoying for them. 
Uh, we also found that people who hadn't used two-factor really needed convincing. Uh, they didn't understand why they had anything that needed to be protected in their accounts. They'd heard bad things from people that they knew. And so they uh, didn't really want to adopt it. And especially if they weren't going to be required to adopt it, why should they? But we found that once people actually used it, it wasn't so bad. Now, I realize this is not a ringing endorsement, um, but uh, we found people saying things like, it's not actually that horrible. Um, and we found that um, for most users, uh, it actually works pretty well. Now that said, we also found a bunch of quarter, corner cases um, where for particular people, there were particular problems and it was that bad. It was really bad. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really important, especially if you make something like this mandatory, that you try to anticipate these, these types of corner cases and try to come up with backup plans that are going to address the needs of people um, who may uh, access your system un under not than most normal conditions. Um, all right, so then uh, another thing that is helpful is having a password manager. Now, the reason having a password manager is so helpful is that really the best way to create passwords is to let your computer randomly generate them for you. Uh, you don't have to spend any time thinking about it. You let your computer generate something, it's completely random. That's gonna be the hardest thing for an attacker to guess. Uh, but of course, that's going to be really difficult for you to remember. But if you have a password manager, you don't even have to try to, re to remember it. You just let your password manager store it for you. Uh, I use one most of the time. I don't even look at the password that the password manager generated. I, I just uh, set it to automatically store in my password manager. Uh, and most security experts will tell you that this is the way to go. Um, now, password managers aren't 100% perfect. It is possible that your password manager could, could get hacked, uh, but the probability of that happening, um, if you, you know, it's a, it's a risk trade-off sort of thing. Um, it, it ends up being that, that uh, the risk for most people, given the way they use passwords, is going to be lower if they use random passwords in a password manager than if they are um, uh, going to you know, reuse the same password over and over again, which is probably what they'll do if they don't have a password manager. All right, nonetheless, the uh, number of people who use password managers is actually pretty low. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing people who actually use the password managers that are built into their web browsers. So that number is going up. Um, but those people tend to not use the password generator. What they're doing is they're using their web browser to store their bad passwords and reuse their bad passwords. They're not actually generating unique random passwords. Uh, so we did a study to understand this phenomenon. Um, some of the key findings we had were, there were a lot of people who were just completely unaware of password managers and what they could do. Um, we also found that a lot of people didn't understand why reusing passwords was a problem. Um, they also thought that password managers that had a big risk of being compromised. And uh, so they were weighing that risk much higher than they should. Um, there were some people who had tried to use password managers and found them confusing, um, which I can relate to because uh, they, they don't all have the best user interfaces. Um, and uh, in general, they found usability and reliability problems when they had attempted to use a password manager. Uh, so um, we still have a ways to go, uh, but, but this is where I think ultimately we, we need to go with, with um, improving passwords um, until we get to the point that maybe we won't have passwords in the future, um, but I don't think that's going to happen everywhere real soon. Okay, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about privacy. Um, and uh, kind of three areas I'm going to touch on quickly. We're going to look at privacy policies and nutrition labels, online tracking icons, and cookie consent banners. All right, so uh, you've all probably seen privacy policies that look like this. Uh, nobody reads them, and you really can't be blamed for not reading them. Um, in fact, we did a study where we looked at the word count of these privacy policies and how often you encounter them. And uh, we came up with the estimate that if you wanted to read them all, you would spend on average 244 hours per year reading the privacy policies at the websites you visit. 
Um, this was an estimate we made back in 2008. Um, and uh, if I had to guess, if we were to try to update it now, we would find um, that it was just as bad, if not worse. It probably would actually be even more now. All right, so uh, knowing that, we realized that that there's really no way that most people are gonna read all or even most or maybe even some of the pri privacy policies they encounter. Um, and uh, I think most experts and probably even most not experts kind of realize this. Um, in 2014, there was a White House report that referred to this as a fantasy world that people would actually read notices before clicking their consent. And that's the web world. When we think about IoT devices, uh, it can be even worse. Uh, you know, how are we going to read the privacy policy on that drone that's flying by, or those smart light bulbs that we, you know, encounter in in a room that we walk into? Uh, so, you know, we wonder how can we actually put people in control of their personal information if we can't, you know, expect them to read all these notices. And, uh, and if we have some ideas for doing this, how do we know whether we've actually succeeded? Uh, so we spent a lot of time thinking about how to actually study this and what criteria we should use to measure the effectiveness of privacy notices, privacy consents, and things like that. Um, so, for example, we might want to know to start with, do people even notice the notice? And if so, do they bother to stop and read it? And if they read it, do they understand it? And if they understand it, do they find that what they understood is actual useful information they wanted to know? And does it have any impact on their behavior? So uh, after having read the notice, do they either say, hey, I don't like that. I'm not going to do business with this organization or, oh, I do like it. I feel comfortable. I'm going to proceed. Um, so does the notice actually have an impact on that? Or do they end up saying, okay, I read it and I'm still confused and I still don't know what to do. And how can we measure notice effectiveness? So some of the things that uh, we've done and, and other um, organizations that, that test not only privacy notices, but notices in other contexts, including things like drug facts notices and, and nutrition labels, is um, you can compare different notice versions or you could compare how people behave when they're given a notice versus when they interact with the same website or product and there's no notice. Um, you can directly ask people comprehension questions um, and to see if they understand what it means. Uh, you can ask them to compare policies, uh, you know, which of these websites is going to collect more information from you. Um, you can also, and, and this is one of my favorite things, you can put the notice in the context of a decision making task. Uh, so you can ask people to actually make a decision. Uh, so my understanding is that when dr drug facts labels are tested, they'll give people a scenario, your child has these symptoms, should you give them this drug? And if so, in what dosage, right? And so the person has to interact with the label uh, to determine whether that's the appropriate drug, drug to be given and, and the dosage. Um, and so that's, that's a great way to test whether people really do understand uh, a notice. Um, but of course, in all of these, we are directly drawing people's attention to the notice. So if we want to know whether people would even look at it or notice it without their attention being drawn, sometimes we use deception. Um, and so we will tell them the study is about something else. The notice happens to be there and we can see whether, whether they actually make use of it um, while doing the task in the study. Uh, when I was at the FTC, we actually had a whole workshop called Putting Disclosures to the Test, and we have all our videos and recommendations from that are all online at the FTC website, um, and uh, there's lots of good stuff uh, that came out of it. Um, some of the things that we found, regardless of what types of notice people were testing, everybody said it's really important to test. And even if you don't have a big budget, even if you don't have a lot of time, even doing a small uh, a small scale test is better than doing no test. Um, and the other really important takeaway was that testing this comprehension in context uh, is also super important. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna show you uh, a couple of studies that we've done at CMU. Um, so 
Um, one study that we did, we had this idea of what if you did a Google search and your search results had privacy meters? Um, would people actually use those privacy meters to uh, decide which website to visit? Um, so we thought, okay, we could give people a hypothetical tasks. We could say search for a product and, a, and you know, they'd see these little meters and we'd say, okay, which site would you buy from? And we figured, well, they're, they're probably just going to say, oh, we'll buy from the privacy site, because uh, why not? They're, they're not actually, there's nothing at risk. They're not actually spending money. So we said, all right, we, we, we should try to do a study where people are actually searching for things. They're actually buying things. They're going to make a, a purchase with their credit card. And this is, of course, expensive and difficult to control. But we did it anyway. It actually took us several times to get it right. Um, and so one of the studies that we did, we brought people into our lab um, and we gave them um, a budget and we asked them to purchase two specific items using our new search engine. And half the people had our privacy meters and half the people did not. They got to keep the change. So there was an incentive to save money, um, but they were using their own credit cards. So there was also an incentive to protect their own privacy. Um, and we did this with one privacy sensitive item and one um, generic item. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's an example of what it looked like. You can see on the left, we have these uh, privacy meters. On the right, we have the, an image of the product and the cost, including shipping, so that we didn't have to deal with uh, different websites that had different shipping fees. Um, and so uh, some people would see um, our privacy meter and some people would see the same thing, except instead of being a privacy meter, it was an accessibility meter. And then some people would see no meter. Um, and we set it up so that when they did their searches, the, the uh, result at the top was always the worst privacy. And the fourth one was the best privacy. And the result at the top was always the lowest price, and the fourth one was the highest price. So what we would expect is that um, if they don't have any information they, about privacy, they are just going to purchase where it's cheapest and at the top of the page. And if they have privacy, our hypothesis was they would go further down the page um, and they would be like, likely to spend a little bit more, um, in this case it was 50, 60 cents more, um, to buy the item with better privacy. Um, and in fact, we found that, of course, not everybody did this, but we, we found a large number of people did this. Um, and we tested this with both the privacy sensitive and the generic product. And we didn't find any difference between products. Um, but we also realized that we hadn't uh, controlled the prices very well. These were real websites, real products. Some of these websites changed their prices in the middle of our study. Um, it, there, were, there were a lot of things that we hadn't controlled well. So we repeated the study, and this time we talked to the websites, we told them they were part of our study, we had to pay some of them, um, and we were able to better control things. We also um, experimented with other user interfaces. Um, so uh, besides the user interface we used in the first study, we also did one where the privacy meter was actually at the top of the website instead of in the search results. And another one where there was a interstitial page. So where you clicked on a search result and you would see this interstitial page. So this time we found that in fact, the more privacy sensitive item, um, which was a sex toy in this case, um, had a much stronger result. Um, and we also found that, the, that we had um, good results for the privacy meters when they were in the search results. But when we put them on the top of the page or in the interstitial, uh, again, we didn't see much effect. All right, so um, those are privacy meters. Uh, we've also talked about privacy nutrition labels. So based on food nutrition labels, um, can we do the same thing for privacy? Um, and uh, after a, a, lots of iteration and user testing, we came up with a way to do this uh, for privacy on websites. Um, this unfortunately hasn't actually been deployed, uh, but it, you know, it worked well in the research lab. What has been deployed is for bank privacy policies. Um, we find that most US financial institutions use this standard um, uh, format for their privacy policies when they send it to you once a year in the mail. 
Um, and this, this is uh, something that was standardized by, uh, by a, a group of several federal agencies working together on this. Um, now that it's been standardized, this gives us an opportunity to collect a lot of data. And so we built a crawler that basically went to bank websites and screen scraped all of these policies. You can see that there's kind of a table at the bottom. Um, and so we screen scraped the table part and made it put in a database, you know, wh what their answers were, yes or no, or whatever. Um, and we built a website where people could search for their bank or search by zip code and find banks and compare them side by side based on their privacy. Now, this is just a demo. Uh, we haven't kept it up to date, um, but this shows you the power of once you put this information in a standardized format, there's a lot more that you can do with it, um, both from the perspective of search and helping consumers, but also for regulators to be able to kind of keep track of what's going on. Uh, we also looked at the idea of putting uh, privacy um, information in the Android App Store. Um, and we did, we did a study to see if this would be helpful. Um, we found that, that putting this information in the App Store actually was very useful to people um, and, and did impact their decision. It wasn't everything. Um, people were still attracted to well-known brands and well-known apps, um, but when they were deciding between apps they were less familiar with, they would often look at privacy as an important factor. So this is something we wrote about in 2013. And almost a decade later, Apple announced that they were adding privacy nutrition labels uh, last year to their app store. Uh, and Google will be doing it uh, shortly. Uh, so this is, this is great news. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, we're curious to see, do these Apple uh, privacy nutrition labels work? Um, and we've started doing some testing and um, unfortunately we're seeing that they actually leave a bit to be desired, um, but you know, it's a good step and hopefully they will um, improve them over time. Uh, we've also looked at the idea of nutrition labels for IoT devices. You know, imagine that uh, all of your uh, smart appliances had some sort of a nutrition label that told you about privacy and security. Uh, and so we've done some testing uh, on that and have a recommendation for what this would look like, um, which we have on our website. Um, icons. So uh, a problem that people often have is that uh, they see ads and then they start seeing the same ad, especially the ad for something that they looked at online, like a pair of shoes, and it's following them around the internet. And um, people have asked me about that and they're like, oh, how can I get these shoes to stop following me around the internet? Um, and um, one of the things that I know as a person who works in this area is that there's this little icon in the corner of the ad. And if you click on it, uh, you can actually get information about the ad and you can tell it to stop tracking you. Most people don't know this. Um, so we did a study, uh, an online survey with about 1500 people and we showed them ads with these icons and different taglines. Usually they say ad choices, but we, we tried a bunch of other taglines, which we sometimes see and some that we made up. Um, and we asked people questions like, what would happen if you clicked on the icon? Um, and what we found is that most people had no idea and gave, gave uh, answers that are really wrong, like more ads will pop up, which is not correct. The correct answer is that it will take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. Um, but you know, only about a quarter of the people knew that. What we found is that if you change the tagline to something like configure ad preferences, um, you can do better and get 50% of the people with the right answer, which is still low, but it's considerably better. So you know, from this, we learned that the words you put next to your icons really make a difference. And that if you care about people understanding your icons, you need to do some iterative user testing to figure out how to make them most understandable. We had an opportunity to try our hand at this when the state of California introduced this uh, do not track my personal information um, uh, link, which uh, their legislation said could have an optional button or logo. So we reached out to the state attorney general's office and said, what is that going to look like? And they said they didn't know. 
So we designed a whole bunch of candidate icons for the state of California. Um, and we did some testing from our initial round of testing. Um, we narrowed it down, we added color. Um, and then we looked at what words should go next to them. And we did what we called our combo testing, where we actually made a fake shoe store website where we put the icon and tagline on the bottom and see um, which um, uh, actually made sense to people. So uh, we recommended this particular icon. Um, and uh, shortly after we recommended it to the state of California, they uh, came out with a, um, their proposed regulation with this red icon. So you can see our blue icon, their red icon. And we looked at their red icon and we said, you know, there's, there's a problem with it and that it looks awfully similar to a toggle switch that you would often see online. And we're worried this would confuse people. Um, and so we ran another study and we tested theirs against ours and we did another variation of theirs. Um, and then we tried it with swapped colors. Basically what we found is, yeah, there wasn't much difference with the small X or the big X, um, but there was a big difference between our icon and their icon. Um, and, and in fact, people were much more likely to misinterpret their icon. We also found that there were only small differences based on color. Um, so, you know, the, the, the important takeaway here, though, uh, besides that people liked our icon, was that you really have to test these things. Um, and if you don't test them, then it's really hard to know um, whether people understand them. Um, so user testing is really critically important. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over a few things because we're running out of time, uh, but I, I will let you know that, that uh, in the end, the uh, state of California did actually adopt our icon, um, although we have not seen it uh, uh, rolled out very extensively. Okay, last thing I want to talk about real quick and wrap up is cookie consent banners. I'm sure you've seen them everywhere. People are really annoyed by having to swat away these cookie consent uh, banners. Um, so we did a study where we um, developed a fake website um, and on our website, uh, we uh, came up with 12 variations on a cookie consent banner and we uh, tested to see what people did with them. Um, so this was what we considered our, the best of the 12 that we tested. Um, and this was the worst. Um, and, uh, you know, in the best, there were actually choices. This one here, there's just one button that says, okay. If you want to make choices, you actually have to follow those links and go to another screen. Um, another uh, bad one was this one where there's just a button that says cookie preferences. And if you, put, if you click on that, then you get all the choices. But um, when we ran our study, what actually happened is nobody actually clicked on that button. So in that best case, we found that about a third of the people selected only the strictly necessary cookies and two thirds um, selected all cookies. Um, we had some small variations that didn't really make much difference. Um, but in that worst practices, we found that most people either didn't make a selection at all or just said, I'll take all cookies. And in that corner button, most people, well, actually nobody interacted with it at all. So you can see that these interfaces actually make a huge difference. And if you test them, you find out exactly what that difference is. All right, I'm going to stop here so that we can take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Lori. And uh, uh, let me um, read you one of the questions. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to uh, remind everybody that you can register now for the February seminar at farm.ucsf.edu slash thirsty slash cybersecurity. So that's uh, for Kevin's talk in February. So um, getting to questions, uh, we'll see how many we can get through in the four minutes. Um, uh, Laurie, here's one question that's more about federal policies and government. So with respect to changing passwords, you know, every, you know, so often some number of minutes or hours, uh, there's a lot of government websites that require that. Um, and so the question from Zenlin is, um, how can we uh, make changes happen sooner given your research evidence uh, on um, uh, federal, federal websites? Yeah, um, well, I would go get, get those um, NIST guidelines and, uh, and take it to your system administrator and ask them why they're not following the, um, the 2017 NIST password guidance. 
Okay, great. Um, we also have uh, a question that's about sort of a combination of the pandemic and also privacy policies. Um, so the question uh, um, from Shuel is, what about sensitive um, private character of any products in the times of global emergencies uh, in the pandemic? I think this question is getting at uh, privacy policies related to um, COVID-19, perhaps even testing, uh, or um, uh, I'm not sure if you got the email about how to get your four free test kits in the United States, but maybe you just make some comments on interesting uh, things related to the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in the rush to get out um, uh, materials and, and uh, tests and vaccines and everything, um, you know, privacy wasn't always top of mind and the, you know, the thing that people really uh, thought through. In some cases, I think they've, they've managed to do a good job anyway because they followed standard procedure in healthcare that was good. Um, in other cases, I think there have been things that have been um, kind of messed up. Um, I think some of the um, the apps that let you like show your vaccine card to people, uh, some of those are really terrible um, as far as uh, not having really any security. Um, but uh, a lot of the other uh, COVID related procedures um, in the US seem to be reasonably okay. Um, but but uh, yeah, I think with anything that is pushed out in a hurry, security and privacy are often some of the first things to fail. Okay. Um, well, uh, let, let's hope it doesn't fail. Um, so uh, I, I have a, a question myself here about Many of the people on the call today are from medical device manufacturers in the industry. They're making medical devices and they're charged with um, security uh, expectations um, by entities such as FDA, but then on privacy for um, other regulatory authorities. Um, I was wondering if you could discuss any recommendations you might have to medical device manufacturers or biomedical engineers going into manufacturing. Um, thinking about user studies, like what user studies should they have in their mind um, when thinking about clinicians using security technology, for instance, on medical devices in hospitals? Are there, are there any um, particular areas that you think are um, sort of good first steps uh, for a manufacturer to better understand the implications of, uh, for humans? Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, start by asking your security experts what assumptions they're making about humans, you know, what, what do you think this clinician is going to do to make sure the security works. Um, and then actually test that in practice and see, you know, if you're assuming, for example, that a clinician is going to type in a password every time, you know, they, they interact with a device or something like that. Um, you know, what we've seen in hospital settings is that clinicians it's really annoying for them to constantly have to type in passwords. Um, and so they'll leave themselves logged in. Um, they'll tape passwords you know, onto uh, devices in the hospital. They don't have to remember them. Uh, if they have cards, they'll leave the card in the slot, right? Rather than taking it out, right? So, um, so basically look at what are the interactions that the clinician has that should be done in some sort of a secure way. And then look at their workflow and what they're actually doing. And to think about, is there some way that is kind of more foolproof, something that, that allows you to have the security without relying on the clinician to take an explicit, explicit security action? Okay. Well, I think we have time for maybe one more question. And I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn to the more operational question, which I'm, you probably can expect. We're getting uh, questions about, so what's, what password manager should I use? Uh, and how would you respond to a question of, of a user, you know, they, maybe they don't want to be a, a crypto security engineer, they, they would just like a solution. What would you recommend they think about on how to find an appropriate password manager? Yeah, so um, most of the well-known password managers that you, you can read about in, you know, like PC Magazine or Consumer Reports or even the Wall Street Journal, uh, those are all good. Anything that's like highly rated from a really, you know, well-known uh, publication, um, they're, they're, they're all pretty similar and I would really trust any of them. Um, they have different features and different um, price models. Um, so, you know, so like some of them have a family plan. I, I personally like that because I got it for my whole family. Um, but um, but th those are all good. I, I would just steer clear of something that, uh, that 
that you know you've never heard of the brand or um, uh, that that wasn't recommended from from a well known organization. Great. Well, I really appreciate you taking your time out of your day and uh, research and teaching uh, at Carnegie Mellon uh, to brief uh, this biomedical engineering community uh, about uh, security and privacy for humans. And just again, final reminder: don't forget to register for the February seminar. You got to register uh, each month. Uh, the URL is uh, up there uh, on the screen. So uh, this concludes uh, the talk today and uh, I wish you all well and keeping your security and privacy usable. <laughs>